Hello, Business 270 Business Statistics. This is Professor Hassey, live and in color from Claremont, California. Today is our week six video. We'll have two videos this week, our introduction of the week today, and then a more extensive review at the end of the week in our weekend update of sample testing, chapters 10, 11, 12. But I wanted to go over uh, our paper that is due this week. And by the way, this is the last paper you'll be doing in this course, paper number three. I know on our syllabus, we had uh, scheduled a paper for week seven. I've decided not to do that paper. I'm uh, going to have that week off, no graded work the next week. So we'll just get prepared for our final examination and get all caught up uh, through chapters 14 for next week. So there'll be no graded work next week. This will be your last graded work. So I know some of you have yet to post a paper two from last week. So you can wrap that up this early week of week six and then start on your paper number three. And then if you need extensions, you have uh, next week to work on it as well without any additional graded work. But paper three is pretty short and sweet, shouldn't take you too long, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So that's where we stand. Uh, we're finishing up and posting paper number two. We're working on paper number three this week, and we're talking about hypothesis testing. Okay, here's where we are in our Blackboard, just to make sure everybody's all understanding what's going on because it does get a little confusing in these eight weeks and we only have two more weeks to go if you can believe it. Uh, first of all, our um, our case studies, are there are now three papers posted. Uh, paper number three has been posted today and it's called Probability Distributions and we'll look at that in a few minutes. Uh, there is no format for this paper so you don't have to worry about APA format or anything like that, just answer the questions, do the analysis in any shape or form that you desire. So do not worry, do not worry about a paper format for paper number three. Paper number two naturally had an APA format and many of you are finishing that up this week. Paper number two, and I will post those grades by the end of the week so you'll see where you stand. Our topics this week are uh, week uh, six, So if we go to the week six file folder, you'll see uh, our learning assignments for this week. Uh, again, paper three is due by next Sunday. We'll be reviewing uh, hypothesis testing, which is segments of chapters 10, 11, and 12. And the PowerPoints and the key topics are listed here. Some review problems that I'll be looking at in, um, in my Friday video that kind of highlight the information of this hypothesis testing. So that's where we stand. Uh, try to get caught up this week, but you can next week there's no graded work. So you can um, have some extra time maybe to work on paper three, but paper three is uh, pretty pretty short. But uh, as a supplet to, pay week, uh, to paper three, let's take a look at a brief uh, short video describing chapter six and probability distributions. We've already spent some time looking at random variables and defining random variables in different ways. And the one that I keep alluding to, maybe because it's one of the simplest definitions of a random variable, is one that's derived from a coin flip, maps the outcomes of a coin flip to some numbers, to a random variable. And so we could say that the random variable is equal to one, or say it's, let's say it's equal to zero, if we get tails on my coin. And let's say if it's equal to one if I get heads on my coin. Now the one thing that this random variable definition is not doing for us so far is telling us the probability of getting our random variable to be zero or one. And to get that information, we need something called a probability distribution. Probability, probability distribution for this random variable. Essentially tells us the probability that we get any one of these outcomes. Now, is this a discrete or a continuous random variable? Well, the outcomes here are distinct, 
They are countable. You could list them. This is definitely a discrete random variable. So we will construct, or we will be taking a look at, a discrete probability distribution. Discrete probability distribution. So let's say someone says, OK, I've defined this random variable in some way for a given coin. Um, and I'm going to give you the probability distribution. And so they come here and they start drawing this probability distribution. And most probability distributions, they tend to be depicted visually. And so here in the horizontal axis, I will plot all of the possible outcomes. So you can view this as kind of the outcomes for my random variable x. So the outcomes are either I'm going to get a 0 or 1. So 0 or 1. There's no other outcomes. I guess you could list other outcomes and just say they have a zero probability of happening. But these are the ones that can actually happen. And then here on the vertical axis, I'll pro plot the probability of getting any one of those outcomes. And so the person tells you, OK, the probability of getting a zero is 50%. 50%, so they draw a little bar here. It's like a histogram, a bar chart. And so this goes right up here to 50%, which I'll draw as a decimal, 0 0.5. And they tell you the probability of getting a 1, of the random variable becoming a 1, is 60%. 60%. Let me draw it just like that. 60, 60% or 0 0.6. Now my question to you, and I know you're just starting to be exposed to probability distributions. But based on what you know about probability, is this a legitimate probability distribution? Well, let's think about what the probability of all of, of getting any, any one of these outcomes. So what, let's, think about, let's think about the probability, the probability that our random variable is equal to 0, or we're doing a union here, not an and, or the probability that our random variable is equal to 1. These are all of the possible outcomes. We're essentially saying, what's the probability that we get one of the possible outcomes for our random variable? Well, over here, we would just add the two probabilities. So the probability of this one right over here is 0 0.5. And then we're taking a union. So, And these are mutually exclusive events. So we can just add the two together. And then we have the probability of getting a 1. The probability of getting a 1 is 0.6. Actually, let me do that in a different color. I'll do it in blue. Blue is 0.6. And this strangely adds up to 1.1. Somehow saying that you have 110% probability of getting any of the possible outcomes. This makes absolutely, this makes absolutely no sense. You cannot have a greater than 100% chance of having any one of the outcomes. If you're looking at all of the outcomes from a random variable, it should add up to 100%. So you point this out to the gentleman who's trying to tell you that this coin is defined in this way, or the probabilities are. And he says, oh, yes, 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 I made a mistake. That was not the probability distribution. This right over here is not 0.5, 0 0.5. Let me clear it. Actually, let me clear this and redraw it. So he realizes that this was actually 0 0.4. 0 0.4. And now my question again to you is this, does this at least look like a legitimate probability distribution? Well, sure. The, the sums of the exclusive outcomes that this random variable can take on now equal to 1, 0 0.6, 0 0.4. And now the last thing I'll ask you, given what you know about this random variable, it's clearly an unfair coin. Are you more likely to get heads or tails? Well, the random variable, you're clearly more likely to get an outcome of 1. If you look at the definition of a random variable, the random variable will be 1 when your coin is heads. So it's clearly somehow the coin is weighted a little bit more probable to having heads. So I'll leave you there. In the next few videos, we'll study more and more probability distributions, which is really the core of probability, and we see it becomes a very helpful thing when we start to study inferential statistics. So that short but uh, a, a sweet <laughs> probability explanation just gives you the basic definitions of what we've looked at and talked about in probability, the likelihood of something occurring. Well, that leads us to our paper number three this week, where, again, as I said earlier, there's no format. It's covering probability. You may ask you to analyze a probability distribution. All right. A random variable is a numerical value determined by the outcome of an experiment or analysis. 
A probability distribution is a listing of all possible outcomes of an experiment analysis and the probability associated with each outcome. We're gonna talk about Croissant Bakery Incorporated, which offers special decorated cakes for birthdays, weddings, and other occasions. It also has regular cakes available in its bakery. The following table that I give you gives the total number of cakes sold per day and the corresponding probability. So if you go to page two, there's over four days, uh, 12, 13, 14, and 15 cakes. And the probability that we will serve 12 cakes on a day is 0.25. The probability that we'll serve 13 cakes a day is 40%. Probability of, again, of 14 cakes a day, 25%. And the probability of 15 cakes a day, 10%, okay? total all those probabilities, it totals to one, okay? Then I give you the calculation for the mean of this data. I take 12 times the probability of 25%, add that to 13 times the probability of 40%, taking 14 times the probability of 25%, and 15 times the probability of 10%, and I get a mean of 13.2. So the average for these cakes per day, based on the probabilities that they will occur, is roughly a little bit more than 13 and 13.2 cakes a day. That's the mean analysis. So now going back to the first page, what I would like you to do is to first of all compute the variance and the standard deviation of the number of cakes sold per day. I've given you the mean, 13.2, now you can determine the variance taking the mean versus each cake per day, and then the standard deviation, which is the square root of that variance. Remember the var variance is taking the difference and squaring it and then adding them together. And then you take the square root of that to get the standard deviation. So then once you do those two calculations, so I wanna see the variance number and the standard deviation number. Once you do that, then answer these questions. What is the difference between a random variable and a probability distribution? Is this analysis a discrete or continuous probability distribution? This analysis of cakes sold per day, explain. And what does this data tell you about the quality of this analysis? By taking a look at the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation, about what type of distribution it is, what does this data tell you, the reader of the information, about the quality of the analysis? That should take you about a paragraph or two. So overall, I'm looking for one to two pages of an analysis, some calculations, and some definitions and analysis of this Croissant Bakery Incorporated and an analysis and a probability distribution of how many cakes they sell per day. And that's what paper three is about. Pretty basic, well, not really basic. The variance and the standard deviation will require a little bit of calculations and thinking, but then your interpretation of the data once you're completed. So that's what I'd like you to do on paper three, do October 2nd. Again, no format, just put them on the piece of paper and send it into me via Blackboard by Sunday at midnight, October 2nd. Now we're gonna take a look at a video uh, that leads us into our topic of this week six, hypothesis testing, which is again, a very key component of statistics, hypothesis testing. So we'll look at this video and then we'll look at specific examples of that in our weekend update this coming weekend. So let's take a look at this video. Let's say that we have four siblings right over here and they're trying to decide how to pick who should do the dishes each night. 
And so the oldest sibling right over here, he decides, well, look, I'll just put all of our names into a, into a bowl. And then I'll just randomly pick one of our names out of the bowl each night. And then that person is going to be, so this is the bowl right over here. And I'm just going to put four sheets of paper in there. Each of them is going to have one of their names. And then I, he's just going to randomly pick it out each night. And then that's the person who's going to do their dishes. So they all say, well, you know, that's, that seems like a reasonable, reasonably fair thing to do. And so they start that process. So let's say that after the first three nights, that he, the, the, oldest, the oldest brother here, and let me, let's, call him, let's call him Bill. Let's say after three nights, Bill has not had to do the dishes. So at that point, the rest of the siblings are starting to think maybe, just maybe, something fishy is happening. So what I want to think about is, what is the probability of that happening? What's the probability of three nights in a row, Bill does not get picked? If, it, if we assume that we were randomly taking, if Bill was truly randomly taking these things out of the bowl and, and not cheating in some way, what's the probability that that would happen, that three nights in a row, Bill would not be picked? And I encourage you to pause the video and think about that. Well, let's think about the probability that Bill's not picked on a given night. If it's truly random, so we're going to assume we're going to assume that Bill's not cheating. So assume assume truly random, truly random, and that each of the sheets of paper have a one in four chance of being picked. What's the probability that Bill does not get picked? Well, there's so let me the probability that no I guess let me write this Bill not picked on a night on a night. Well, there's four equally likely outcomes, and three of them result in Bill not getting picked. So there's a three-fourths probability that Bill is not picked on a given night. Well, what's the probability that Bill's not picked three nights in a row? So let me write that down. So the probability Bill not picked three nights, nights in a row. Well, that's the probability he's not picked on the first night times the probability that he's not picked on the second night times the probability that he's not picked on the third night. So that's going to be 3 to the third power, or 3 times 3 times 3. So that's 27 over 4 to the third power. 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. And if we want to express that as a decimal, so that is 27. Let me get my calculator out. That is 27 divided by 64 is equal to, and I'll just round to the nearest hundredth right here, 0 0.42. So that is equal to 0 0.42. And so this doesn't seem that unlikely. It's, it's a little less likely than kind of even odds, but it's not, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't question someone's credibility if, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a 42%, roughly a 42% chance that three nights in a row, Bill would not be picked. So this, this seems like if you're assuming truly random that, that well, it's, it's a reasonable, I, your, your hypothesis that it's, re, it's truly random seems, seems you know, that there, there's a good chance that, that you're right. It's, it's a four, there's a 42% chance you would have the outcome you saw if your assumption is true. But let's say, let's say you keep doing this and, and you, you trust your older brother. You know, why, why would he want to cheat out his, his younger siblings? But let's say that Bill's not picked 12 nights in a row. So then everyone's starting to get, everyone's starting to get a little bit, everyone's starting to get a little bit suspicious, suspicious with Bill, with Bill right over here. And so they say, well, you know, let, well, we're going to give him the benefit of the doubt, assuming that, that he's being completely honest, that he, this is a completely random process. What is, the, what is the probability that he would not be picked 12 nights in a row? Well, just, just write that down. So the probability, Bill, and it's really the same stuff that I just wrote up here. I'll just say, Bill not picked 12 nights in a row. Well, that's going to be three, you're going to take 12 three fourths and multiply them together. It's going to be three fourths to the 12th power. And what is this going to be equal to? Well, let's see. If you take, well, three fourths is, I'll just write three divided by three divided by four, which is going to be 0 0.75 to the 12th power. 
Now this is a much smaller. This is now if we actually this is going to be 0.3, I guess we could go to a we could go to one more decimal place, 0.32 or we could say so let me this is 0.0.032 I should say, which is equal to so this is approximately equal to let me write that which is equal to 3.2%. So now you have every right to start thinking that something is is getting fishy. You, you you could say well look you know if there was and this is what statisticians actually do they often define a threshold as hey you know if the probability of this happening purely by chance is is more than 5%, then I'll say well maybe it was happening by chance. But if the probability of this happening purely by chance was, you know, and and this is the the threshold that st statisticians often use is 5%, but that's somewhat arbitrarily defined. But this is a fairly low probability that it would happen fairly by chance. So you might be tempted to reject the hypothesis, to reject the hypothesis that it was truly random, that Bill is is cheating in some way. And you could imagine if it wasn't 12 in a row, if it was 20 in a row, then this probability becomes really 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 small and and so your hypothesis that it's truly random starts to really come in come into doubt. What we're going to do in this video What we're going to do in this video is talk about hypothesis testing, which is the heart of all of inferential statistics, statistics that allow us to make inferences about the world. So to give us the gist of this, let's start with a tangible example. Let's say hypothetically, you run a website that has the mission of giving everyone on the planet a free education and you want to think about how you might change the amount of time people spend on the site. Ideally, you want to increase the amount of time people spend on the site so there's more learning on the planet. Well, currently, the website has a white background like this and the mean amount of time people spend when you have a white background, the mean amount of time when you have a white background is 20 minutes. And you or someone on your team, maybe you read some type of study that's like that says yeah, people like to spend more time on yellow backgrounds. I don't actually think that's true, but let's just go with that for the sake of this video. And so you have a hypothesis that if you actually have a yellow background, if you change your background to yellow, that the mean amount of time that people spend on a yellow background, on yellow, is going to be different, is not going to be equal to the mean amount of time people spend on a white background. So the question is how do you test this and how do you feel good about your inferences that you make from your test? And that is the heart of hypothesis testing. And medical research, actually almost all research involves some form of hypothesis testing. So how would you do this? Well, the standard way to do this is to set up a couple of hypotheses. Hypotheses, I should say. The first one is known as your null hypothesis. And I often think about this as the skeptics hypothesis. Skeptics think that hey, it's hard to make a difference in this world or cynics feel like it's hard to make a difference in the world. And so they always have this null hypothesis, this thing, hey, you think you're making a difference, but you aren't. So the null hypothesis is that the mean amount of time people spend on the yellow site on or on a yellow site is going to be equal to the mean amount of time that people spend on the current site or the existing site or on a white site while the people who are thinking about hey how do we make change how do i make improvements in the world they had some type of hypothesis and we call that the alternative alternative hypothesis and so the alternative hypothesis a for alternative is that the mean time on the yellow site on the yellow site is actually different is actually different is not equal to the mean amount of time on the white site. So how do we think about this now that we set up these hypotheses? Well, what we're going to do is we are going to assume we assume the null hypothesis. Then we build this yellow site and then we take a sample of the people using the yellow site. And we say what is the probability of getting that sample mean which is an approximation of the parameter of the true mean what is the probability of getting that sample mean if we assume the null hypothesis and if the probability of getting that sample mean on the yellow site assuming the null hypothesis is really low 
then we reject the null hypothesis, which suggests the alternative. On the other hand, if we get a sample mean that seems pretty reasonable to get if you assume the null hypothesis, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and then that would not suggest the alternative. Now to make this a little bit more tangible, and we'll go over this into a lot of videos, if you assume the null hypothesis, then there's a few things you can think about. You can think about just the general distribution of the amount of time people spend on the site. It would look something like this. We will, for this sake, assume that it's a normal distribution. And normal distributions are very important, and or things that are close to normal distributions for hypothesis testing. But let's say that it's a normal distribution of the amount of time people spend on the site. And so there is some mean. We know that mean. So the mean that people spend on that white site is equal to 20 minutes. And remember, we're assuming the null hypothesis. So we're assuming that this is also the amount of time that people would spend on the yellow site. We've assumed, assuming the null hypothesis. And you could view this as time or distribution of time spent. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about in future videos is, if you have this distribution, you can actually come up with a dis another distribution of the means of samples you might get. So there's something else called the sampling distribution, and I know it's very confusing at first, sampling distribution of the sample of the sample mean, and it'll be for a given sample size, for sample size, sample size, let's say this is sample size 1,000. I'm just making things up. I could have said n, but I'm just going to make this a little bit more tangible. Well, we're going to get statistical methods for how you can think about this distribution, assuming this distribution we have on the left. And it turns out this distribution is going to look like the one on the left, but it's going to be narrower around that mean. It's going to look something like this. And actually, the larger your sample sizes are going to be, the narrower it's going to get. Now remember, this isn't just the distribution of the amount of time people spend on the site. This is the distribution that if I were to take a sample of the amount of time people spend on the site and calculate the means, this is the distribution of those sample means I might get. Now, the center of this distribution is still our mean for white, which is equal to the mean for yellow. Remember, we're assuming the null hypothesis, the mean for yellow. But each of these points, like for example, if I think about this, this is the amount of time that someone might spend, and you can see that there's a low probability about it. This over here, this would be a sample mean you might get for a time that you sampled 1,000 people and you calculated the mean, and you see that there's a low probability for it. So then what you would do is, if you were able to statistically generate these things, assuming the null hypothesis, and don't worry too much, we'll find out the techniques for doing this and the assumptions we need to make for doing this, what we do is then take a sample of 1,000. So you take your sample of 1,000, so sample 1,000, and then from that, you are able to calculate a sample mean. You are able to calculate that. And let's say you get a sample mean of 30 minutes. And let's say actually that that is right over here, that this is 30 minutes right over here. The center was 20 minutes. The next thing what you do is you say, what's the probability of getting a result at least that extreme? Assuming the null hypothesis. And that high probability on these curves, it would be this right tail here, and it would be a left tail that is equally far on the left side. So it would be like that. And what you do is you look, you look at this probability, which would be this, these yellow areas there, and then we think about the probability of getting a result at least as extreme as 30 minutes. So probability of getting, getting a sample mean at least as extreme as the sample mean equaling 30 minutes, assuming, assuming your null hypothesis, and that's exactly what those yellow areas are all about, and you compare that to some pre-specified threshold. So that threshold is oftentimes 5%, sometimes it's 1%. 
But if this probability is less than or equal to, if it's less than or equal to your threshold, and this threshold is oftentimes denoted by the Greek letter alpha, well, we say, hey, that was a very low probability of getting a result at least, at least this extreme if we assume the null hypothesis. And so that will allow us to reject, reject the null hypothesis, which would suggest, suggest the alternative. Notice, we haven't proven the alternative. We also haven't proven that the null hypothesis is for sure false. We've just said if we assume the null hypothesis, there's a very low probability of getting a result at least as extreme as what we just got, so we will reject the null. Now, if it's the other way around, if the probability of getting a sample mean is at least as extreme as this is still reasonable, if it's greater than your pre-specified threshold, then you fail to reject the null. You fail to reject your null hypothesis. So I'll leave you there. In future videos, we'll go into much more depth into all of this. But this is to give, the, give you a sense of how hypothesis testing allows science, or all of us in the world, to start making inferences that we can feel good about. So that's a start to our hypothesis testing. And we're going to be spending a couple of weeks on this, looking at it. Now, I know it seems kind of like, ah, help. But it really is, once we get the hang of it, and we'll talk more about this in detail in our Friday, uh, weekend update video, but it's basically a great way of testing theories in business. Do we think we can sell to this demographic group? Do we think we can grow our business in a particular market area. And we can do these sample testing of whether we think it's going to happen or reject it, and that helps us make business strategic decisions. And we'll kind of pull all that together <clears throat> in our weekend video. But for now, uh, you have paper three to work on, which is probability distributions, which is the beginning of thinking of this, and then uh, a review of hypothesis testing for later on the week. No graded work next week. This will be the last paper you do. Our next graded work after this week six will be our examination in week eight. So have a great week, everybody. If you need any questions or have any concerns, remember my Thursday office student hours at 6 to 9 p.m. And have a great week. Bye-bye.